This episode of the Sam Oldham Podcast is sponsored by Turn, the only brand dedicated solely to men's gymnastics. Towards the end of my career, I started to work closely with the team at Turn to design custom uniforms that expressed who I was and where I came from, and they were always able to bring my ideas to life. For years, I wore uncomfortable gymnastics clothing until I started to wear Turn, whose uniforms are built with their attention to detail and quality in mind. Go check them out now at turn-gymnastics.com and enjoy the episode. In 2023, Fred Richard became the youngest male gymnast to ever win an individual World Championships medal for Team USA. The US men's team also took a bronze medal, putting themselves in the driving seat ahead of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games this summer. Fred only competed in his first elite level national championships in 2019, and in a short space of time, is already one of the most exciting gymnasts in the sport. He represents the Michigan Wolverines college team, and competes in the NCAA, and over the past 12 months, his profile has grown substantially both in and out of the gymnastics community, and this is his story. How was that? Was that right? right. Anything wrong? Yeah. Good? Okay, That's sweet. <laughs> it's, it's really good to have you on, mate. Uh, you are the first guest we've had um, that is international, so up until this point, it's just been gymnasts that are within the UK and athletes that compete in the UK. So big step for us. We're really grateful. I know that you'll be very busy right now. Uh, this is a Sunday. Is Sunday your day off or do you train on a Sunday? Yeah, Sunday is the day off or the lighter day. Okay. Still in the gym. I'm in the gym right now. This is our like coach's meeting room, but you know, light day. Oh, nice. So do you, do you train seven days a week? Yeah. So I, I like doing that seven days a week. But the Sunday is probably about two hours. Okay. We, I do some yoga and then I do physical therapy. Really not really touching equipment, just keeping the body moving. Okay, wow. That's, days, re- that's really interesting. Yeah, that's, I think in the UK, pretty much six days a week. No one really does seven. So um, yeah, that's quite, in- I think towards the end of my career, I used to go to like a fitness gym, maybe do a similar thing, just get the body moving, have a sauna, like go in the plunge pool and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah, seven days, that's a big commitment. Do you feel like you would do seven days a week, Fred, if you weren't, because I guess right now you're on college campus, is that right? Yeah. So do you feel like if you weren't on college campus and the gym wasn't right there next to you, you would still do seven days a week? Yeah, that's a really good question because before I came to college, I was doing six days a week also. Mm -hmm. Um, Then I obviously got to college, started pushing that higher level kind of really love the feeling of just consistency. There's not like a Monday, like I kind of have to come back after that one day lag. I just like, you know, being able to keep going. Um, But yeah, I'm one minute away from the gym, so I can just walk here whenever I want. And I was 40 minutes away before, so I couldn't. I don't know. Now that I know what it feels like, Mm -hmm. I would keep doing it. But I guess before I came here, I didn't know anything different. So I did six days a week. Do you think that's maybe uh, a challenge at times, Fred, in that you're so close to the gym when you study at university or you're at college, or even let's say you train at a national center if you're on a national team, and the gym's right there, you potentially end up doing more work than you would do normally because it's right there. And maybe you've got nothing else to do with your day, so you stay in the gym a bit longer, you do more reps. Do you think uh, at any point, maybe now you're 19, right? So you're super young. Yeah. So you're fresh. You've got the juice to do that. Do you think maybe towards the end of your career, if you were somebody that was, I don't know, mid 20s, they've been training for 20 years, maybe their body isn't quite as fresh as it used to be. Have you have you witnessed any guys that you look at and you go, wow, you're probably spending a bit too much time in the gym right now? Great, uh, great question. I would think, this is my belief personally, okay. I don't think there's a such thing as too much time in the gym. I do believe in overworking and not being smart while you're in the gym. Now, not everybody in college comes to the gym seven days a week. I'm definitely probably one of the only ones that does. But I know guys that go go six days a week, and when they're in the gym, they go twice as hard as me. Right. And then they take much more damage. So I don't think there's ever – I think you could be in the gym for 10 hours a day, but I don't think you'd be on the equipment for more than two and a half to three hours a day. You know what I mean? But then there's those other things you can obsess over, the flexibility, the, I guess you could just be watching gymnastics. I don't know, 10 hours is an over-exaggeration, <laughs> but I think my freshman year, I had to learn what working smart is over just working hard. Mm-hmm. I came to the gym a lot, but I was doing more when I was in the gym. Now I come to the gym, I live here, but I know how to work smart. I know what my body needs and what's too much for it. And that's just the mastery of the sport, figuring out what's the right amount. So it's more the intensity of the work you're actually doing rather than the hours spent in the gym. I think a lot of people focus on the number of hours, don't they? 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I don't understand that. Because like, even my coaches sometimes, they, they really like efficiency because I get it from their standpoint. They're sitting in the gym. They just want to watch you get it all done and move. Me, I'd rather be in the gym for five, for a five or six hour practice than a three to four hour practice and just move much slower, recover between each turn, think about every turn and just enjoy it. Like just relax. But at the end of the day, I did the same amount of turns as someone who could do it in three hours. Mm. But I think you can do a higher quality with recovering and like taking every turn very seriously than just cramming it into three hours and, and just pushing yourself. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I think that's probably how we had a, a gymnast on this week. He's from the UK, but has gone out to study in Japan and trains in Japan. Uh, yeah. And I know that when I've trained with the Japanese gymnasts in the past, they tend to spend two hours on one skill sometimes, but like yeah. just probably the intensity is a little bit lower, but rather than racing around doing six pieces, they turn down the volume on that intensity, but they really focus on one skill and spend a lot longer in the gym doing it. And then sometimes they'll have like two or three days off. I never could really work out the whether there was a pattern to the training that they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was really, really yeah, it was really different. I could never work that out. Fred, I want to I wanna start with kind of the present time before we go back in time a little bit today with okay. you. Um, what was it like uh, 31st of December this year when you stepped into the new year and you were in an Olympic year? You know, this is something that when you're a kid, you dream of for a long time, right? I want to have a chance at trying to go to an Olympic Games. What were the feelings that you had at that point, you know, knowing, right, this is it, this is an Olympic year, and I'm really in contention to make that team? Yeah, great question. Of course, the first feeling is excitement. Like, in this sport, obviously, this is what you dream of your whole life. This is, now you finally have that platform to make your name, to prove all the hard work you've done. But then there was also this feeling of, you know, when everything counts on one moment, there starts to be a little bit of a fear of not, obviously, performing at the highest level you know you can on that exact day, you know? And then I had to come back kind of, what am I afraid of? Because if I logically think about it, there's no going down from for this year. You know, I can't lose my titles that I've already gained, my respect I've already gained. It can only go up. Yeah. But then this feeling of kind of fear of missing out, like the FOMO of if I don't perform to the level I know I can, mm. how much will I miss out on it on this one chance? And from there, I had to figure out kind of a new way of thinking about the Olympics, a new way of not overhyping this as the one moment that counts because I think to put that much pressure on yourself, I don't think is the best way for anybody to train day to day and obviously perform in that moment. And so now I've, it starts to more and more just become a normal experience coming up in what, four months, five yeah. months, just another day almost. And I'm more focused on every day is the Olympics. I'm winning every single day, not I'm just trying to win four months from now. And so when I'm just thinking about winning every day, there's a lot less pressure because I know what I have to do every day and I can do it pretty easily. And when it comes to that day, I think I'll become that person I'm supposed to be and perform at that level that will get me those titles. It's great that you acknowledged that feeling that you had around that fear because most people would ignore it and they would put it to the back of their mind, but it would be there, you know, like an elephant in a room. It's great that you kind of like tackled that head on and just kind of asked, what is that? Like a curious, almost like being quite curious because then you can yeah. work out what it is, back engineer it and then move forwards. It's really interesting that you did that, mate. How was your training over the winter, that winter block? You know, this was your first experience of having a world championships, going to a major championships with USA, doing very well. And then you mm -hmm. have that come down after the competition what has your training been like the last few months over the winter? Great question. Um, this is this definitely training in the last winter has been a question of, do I really know how to train basically? Because at this point, it's all about peaking at the right period. You know, you're thinking about the Olympics. You're like, oh, I want to push really hard every day. If I just max out, hopefully I'll be way better by the Olympics. But obviously, you know that that's how you destroy your body, right? And so this has become a period of, working as smart as possible in terms of how do I stay healthy, but improve all my weaknesses and, and get new skills. And the stay healthy part is a hard emphasis because hammering numbers is not the way to go. You know, when I first came back two months in, I was doing upgraded ring sets, full sequences, full routines, trying to just push the difficulty. And then my shoulder starts hurting mm. and then I have to take two weeks off and I'm like, okay, that's not the right strategy. Then I go to, I was doing palm wars, pushing it very hard. 
Um, I scored like a 13-6 in the all-around on palm horse, and I know I could score much better. I started pushing it, pushing the endurance, hundreds and hundreds of circles a day. Um, one of my competitions, I broke 15-0 of a score in the college, in the collegiate level. And I'm like, oh, I'm on the way. If I keep this up by the Olympics, I'll be looking real strong. Then my wrist starts hurting mm. because I'm doing too many numbers every day. And then I really have to think, okay, let's take a step back. Why don't I work backwards, make a six months plan, and then make like work backwards from that of every week, how am I going to progress to peak right and not overwork my body, but still improve the techniques that I want. And so that's what these months have been. You know, I'm not, it's been weird because it's not what I'm used to of just, you know, routine, like one on six, one and a half on six every other day. It's been kind of just focus on the details. I'm already past that point of needing crazy amounts of routine numbers. And that's, that's the difference right now. Yeah, that's super interesting, mate. And when you're having those conversations with yourself where you're thinking, right, I need a six-month plan, is that all coming from you? Or is that you and your coaches? Is it driven by your coach mainly? How does that work? What's that relationship like? Yeah, so I think my coaches... So my coaches have said it before, but they never really pushed it. They, Because, I mean, they have this plan in, in their head at the same time, but it's not detailed. You know, it's not two weeks from now you're going to add this skill in and two weeks from that you're going to add this skill in. It wasn't very detailed. It was kind of, because it's easy when you look good already in the gym to just be like, man, I feel good enough. Let me add a skill right now without thinking of the repercussions a couple weeks later. Yeah. And I know when I was younger, growing up with my junior coach, we would always make probably a two month plan out from a big international competition, never six months out, but two months. And so I kind of just combined what I used in the past with, where I am now to, to, and then talk to my coaches and they thought it was a great idea and worked with them to come up with a smart plan. What was, the, what is the focus and the strategy, Fred? You know, you've, you've been to a world championships, you were very successful, right? So you win a bronze medal in the all around, you win a, a bronze medal in the team, you put four scores up that count for the team score. From this point out, are you going, right, we just need to clean these routines up? Or are you going, right, I still need to push the difficulty? What was the plan strategically uh, going into this year? Yeah. So I'm definitely still pushing some more difficulty while cleaning up, but the difficulty I'm pushing isn't new skills that I have never competed before, never done. I still took things out at world championships to just choose routines that I've fully mastered. Now it's putting back the skills that I've still competed before. I still pretty much am a master of, but I didn't have it all together or the endurance to handle six more skills across my all around at the world championships is getting those extra six skills in that gains me another point and a half in difficulty. And so the strategy is, you know, how do I get those skills in and keep cleaning up? And most of it's more building the endurance to handle the skills more than just getting the skills because the skills are pretty much mastered. And so it's, it's definitely creating a plan of ramp up. The, the key to the plan of ramp up is, if I start with simpler routines, I can really focus on the execution okay. as I ramp up. If I start with the six two-star values for the first two months, it's going to be pretty sloppy. It's not going to be as consistent. I'm not going to really build that muscle of like perfection. And it's never a question of will I hit. It's just a question of can I get nine something execution. And so that's the mentality now. Of just keep building up in the background, perfect the skills yeah. on the side, kind of still emphasizing the skill work, but a good ramp up plan of, your body isn't just taxed from the beginning, pushing these six, two sets across all, all um, events. It just slowly builds up. And as my body gets stronger, my routines are getting stronger and harder. And it's just this kind of very synchronous growth plan. Yeah. Is it tough, Fred, when you're competing for a college team and the coaches there at the college, their main priority is the college team's success? Mm -hmm. For you... I'm sure that is, but equally your own individual goals to go and compete for Team USA at an Olympic Games. How hard is it to balance that? And also how tough is it for the coaches to balance your plans as well, your individual plans as well as the whole team? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say number one, the college I'm at right now, University of Michigan, I'm very grateful for because this this situation that you just thought of, like brought up is the one I had to think about like a lot when I was getting recruited to college okay. because this is a serious problem that, you know, hurts a lot of guys who have a lot of Olympic potential, but then downgrade all season long or do too many competitions and mm -hmm. hurt their bodies for that high level performance. So when I was choosing Michigan, I was thinking, what's a team that's good enough 
that I don't, they don't need me to compete every competition to win. You know, I chose a team that already had very, a good amount of talented guys that one could push me in the gym, but can also back me up and I can rest some competitions and they can handle the load. Okay. Right. So I chose a team like that. And then I also chose a team with coaches who also have that Olympic goal and Olympic plan. My coach, Xiao, Yuan Xiao, he's from China. He was on the Chinese national team for years coaching. He's, you know, he coached Olympians from China. Mm -hmm. So he has that same high level mentality of still trying to become the best in the world. And so at Michigan, I think it's, it's not as hard as other colleges because I don't have to compete every week. The coaches, we, they only really need me for the two biggest competitions of the year, big tens and NCAA championships. Other than that, I'm kind of just using every competition as a testing ground. And so that's the beauty of being at the college I'm at. And, Fred, the college that you're at and the coaching team there, are they the same coaching team or a similar coaching team to the one that was in place at Michigan when Sam was at Michigan, Sam McCulloch training, and then he went and Mm. competed at 2012, or is it completely different? So it's pretty much very different. So Yuan Shao, the head coach now, he was an assistant coach when Sam McCulloch was competing. Okay. The head coach when Sam McCulloch was competing, he retired. Okay. And then we have a new assistant coach. So the college team so, has had that experience of having someone that at 19 went on to have a lot of success very early on. So that do you yeah. feel like in a way that helps as well? Because there's already almost like a pathway that somebody else has been, de- been, been down quite recently. Yeah, I think that definitely helps a lot. You know, Sam created the template. Now I, I see his template and I can tweak it yeah. or go with it the way I want, but that does help. In your experience, Fred, going to compete internationally, do you yep. notice a big difference between the college gymnastics and in terms of what I'm talking about specifically is like the level and especially the scoring to then competing internationally? And what is that big difference, if there is one? I would, yeah, I would say there's a huge difference. Okay. And it, I mean, it's why I dominate in the college field. Um, these, the guys, it's kind of just a little, everything's elevated. The difficulty is elevated. The execution is elevated. The mindset is elevated. Right. You know, these guys aren't trying to just hit a routine. You can tell these guys dedicated everything to the sport, the international guys. Where in college, for some people, it looks like it might be a side thing. You know, they're focused on their majors, their future careers, and they do gymnastics for fun. Mm -hmm. At these high-level colleges like Michigan, yes, there's many other kids also pushing that level, but... I think it's just one level down. Okay. But I think it's a good, I think it's a great field of testing when you're at the Olympic level to go in this kind of, this competition Mm -hmm. environment, test new things under, you still have a little bit of pressure, but not some crazy amount of pressure where you don't want to try a new skill, throw it in there or try fixing something different under pressure. And so I I think it's the perfect testing ground before you move to the international level where everything's supposed to be very refined Yeah, I think it's interesting because when I was younger and I was competing uh, and I would see like scores from the NCAA competition, college competitions, or even to be honest, US Nationals or Winter Cup, I would always take them with just a pinch of salt because I'd always take about a mark off a top score and think they're slightly inflated. Like they're getting bonuses for stick and stuff and I'd be like, "Eh, we'll see what they score when they come to the Worlds. It's interesting. I had an experience of that where we had a British Championships in 2011 and what they did Mm -hmm. was they massively inflated the scores in the UK at that competition. And then when we went to the World Championships and we got real scores yeah. then it, everybody's it confidence just dropped massively because they were like whoa i can't score 92 yeah that was uh, <laughs> it's really interesting and i think that's maybe that's that has potentially hindered like american teams in the past i think not so much mm-hmm. now but in the past i think sometimes to me i've got the impression they've come in with almost uh their expectations of themselves were too high and then mm-hmm. they've had the qualification event maybe finished instead of thinking, right, I'm going to finish like top three. They finished fourth or fifth. The scores were a lot lower and then they're confused because like, whoa, when we're back home in the States, I'm scoring 15-5 on P-bars, but now I'm scoring 14-7. What's that? It's really interesting as a, a gymnast that's international to you uh, to kind of watch that. But I do think it's changed a little bit in the, in the last few years. It might have changed a little bit. You're definitely right. There's much more inflation, I would say, in college gymnastics, number one, and then some U.S. judging. I think the Winter Cup and the U.S. Championships are a lot more realistic. Mm-hmm. The college is definitely a lot overscored. I usually go back and score my routines more realistically. I think they do it for 
for because they know most of these guys aren't going to compete internationally. So right. it's almost like a sport in its own, you know. Okay. So they want to have bigger scores and reward people more in the U.S. Um, but I just go back and rejudge it and be honest. I mean, it's yeah. the question is, are you honest with yourself? Yeah. You know, my coach used to say you're only cheating yourself. So if, if you're not working out as much as you know you need to or you're thinking you deserve a higher score than you really shouldn't, I mean, you're just cheating yourself. At what age, Fred, did you start competing competitively, like, nationally? Like, was there a time where you went, okay, I'm quite good at this. Like, I'm, I'm able to compete against some of the other guys from around the country. Uh, and when was that? Yeah, um, do you mean in the senior level or just... Probably juniors, general? juniors, mate. At what age did you really start to think, right, I'm quite talented at this, I enjoy it, but I'm actually able to compete with the best guys? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, I don't know if they do the same thing in the UK, but in the US, they have a Future Stars program. So this starts at age 10 years old. Okay. This is kind of where kind of your mindset awakens, I guess, in the U.S. They take us, 10-year-olds, 10, 11, 12, 13. They have us do all the same exact routines. This is, this is about just compulsory, ex executing as cleanly as possible. And then the top eight in each age group make the U.S. junior national team. Okay. This is when they start taking us to, to one of our state's national team camps, and just kind of telling us, you're the future of this country. You guys are going to represent us in the Olympics one day. Start training now for it, basically. <laughs> and so that's when I... Re and that was funny because at that point, I was 10 years old. I When I went to that competition, I, I, was, I competed and I was standing on the ninth place afterwards. And eight, eight people make that U.S. national team. And I was like about to cry. I remember trying to just hold back tears the whole time. And then when they announced who made the team... They said there's a tie for eighth place. And so I was standing on the ninth place spot, but I tied for eighth place. Oh, wow. And that was, yeah, that, that probably changed my whole career if I think about it, because that's the cutoff between going to these national team camps, working with the best kids in the country and seeing the Olympians there in the same training facility versus just being back at your home, home gym without that extra push. And so from 10 years old, 10 years old, I was very competitive. I didn't want to stay at eighth place. Every year from then, I just climbed it. Sixth place, fourth place, third place, and then now one of the best. So who were the people that were around you at that point, Fred, when you were growing up and you were a teenager and you're starting to go to national training camps? Because, like, speaking to you today, for a 19-year-old, you're incredibly intelligent, and it seems mm -hmm. like you're thinking everything through, uh, very self-aware. Who were the people yeah. that were molding you when you were growing up? Was it parents? Was it the coach that you had before you went to college? Yeah, I would say it's definitely, I'll give it first to my coaches before college, okay. but then of course parents too. Uh, my two, first coach, Tom Fantucchio, in the gym I grew up in, if you looked at it, if you, if you came to my gym, you'd say it's a joke. It's, it's funny because I mean, this wasn't a meant to be an international level gym, like gymnastics facility or even national high level gymnastics facility. You know, my coach, Tom Fantucchio, he started the gym. I was one minute up the gym like up the road from the gym. So that's why I chose that gym just because okay. it was closest. Then he saw I had some potential and he went out of his way to study and learn how to coach me correctly. You know, he said, okay, I need to figure out how to coach Pommels to a much higher level. Let me figure out this. He would take me to other gyms. We didn't have a good pit in the, in the facility. I couldn't do release moves off of learn release moves into a, like a good pit landing. And so he would take me to other gyms across the state um, work with other coaches and just get me to the extra level. Yeah. He went out of his way to do that. There's no incentive to it. I mean, he runs a business. He could have just focused on getting more kids in the program and making more money, but mm. he took it to that extra level. And then when I was 14, so he did the Future Stars kind of process with me. Right. When I was 14, he said, you've basically outgrown this gym, you know, we're using very old floor, very old equipment or just not that high level equipment. We need to bring it to a new facility, get you some high level equipment so you can really learn those extra hard skills. That's when he referred me to my next coach, who's Levon Karakanyan. He's Armenian. He grew up in Armenia, the Soviet Union, okay. internet, international level gymnastics. And he was able to kind of take me to the next level after that. That's really cool, mate. Uh, and it's great that that first coach of yours as well was able to go, right, you've outgrown me and what I'm capable of because you, you will have experienced this yourself. A lot of people in the world of gymnastics have got big egos, right, when it comes to coaching. So to have been able to say to you, look, Fred, I don't think there's much more that I can teach you. It's time for you to move on. That's an amazing thing to do for somebody. Um, what advantages do you think you have 
being an athlete in the US, Fred, uh, as opposed to uh, somebody that's competing internationally? Because, you know, it's interesting in the UK, we don't have a college system that doesn't exist. And yeah. one of the big problems I think we have in our country is that there are so few opportunities to learn how to compete in gymnastics. So if you're one of the top guys in the country, but let's say you're not competing at the world championships or the European championships, you might be the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth guy right but you have aspirations to get onto that team there might only be four or five competitions in the whole year and it's really hard right to learn how to compete like how Whoa. what does that pressure feel like what are nerves like what's it like when my brain's telling me to like run away at every opportunity because i'm nervous um yeah do you think it's a real advantage having that college system in the u.s oh 100 i think last year i think i competed about 15 15 plus competitions okay and I think that was my year of really growing, like making that next jump to the high level. I wouldn't have been where I was at world championships without that experience beforehand. Now, not everybody should compete that many competitions. It's a lot on the body, but it prepared my mind completely for that high level experience. And there's so much testing that you need to do under pressure to really get to that high level. You know, all the guys that dominate, they've been in the game for how many years competing at how many world championships. That's because they just gained that experience from competing so I think being in the U.S. and having those opportunities when I want to just compete, I think it helps me just get to the next level of being the best competitor in the world. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the Olympic champion is not going to be the best gymnast of the world. It's going to be the best competitor of the world. That's really interesting. That's really interesting that you say mm -hmm. that. And I guess you're, you're right, right? Uh, like on the day, probably those top mm -hmm. four or five guys could probably all beat each other. It's all about who, mm -hmm. uh, who can do it on the day under pressure. Uh, and it was interesting what you said earlier on in the podcast, you know, the stress of trying, if you really sit and think about it in your head, you're like, right, I might have to train 15 years to do six routines on the right mm -hmm. day, which in total lasts for maybe two and a half minutes, but I'll train 15 years for that moment. And I need to make sure that I'm fit and healthy to get on the team and then to be ready on the actual day of the Olympic Games. Uh, it's a lot of pressure, right, to be ready for that moment. So, uh, yeah, that's super interesting. Tell me, Fred, a little bit about your experience at the World Championships last year. Uh, what was that like? And what were your aspirations going into that competition? And did you surprise yourself with the results that you had? Yeah, um, great question. I guess I'll start with um, aspirations going into the competition. I'm always the type to aim very high and prepare for those big goal so I was trying to get on the podium of course and I knew it was very possible for the team and then for me personally and all around and events um and so I was just aiming as high as possible I knew it was possible I knew I put in the hard work that I could do it now when it came to the team and preparing for the team competition our team had only one person previously you and Moldauer who had competed at world championships before we're a very new very young team but we all came from the college atmosphere in the US. And I think that helps us a lot because we all came from college teams where we, we work day in and day out with our teams to build the strong team spirit that allows us to go out on the floor, trust every one of our routines, like have complete like unison in, in our teamwork. And I think we knew those t team building strategies beforehand, those team meetings, not with coaches, but with ourselves okay. of just getting everything out there and talking it out and, you know, talk like, sending videos to each other before the competition and, and just getting as close as possible to really feel like, you know, we're hundred percent comfortable with each other on the floor. I think we knew those bu team building strategies and we used them beforehand. And so when we're at that team final, I mean, I don't even know how to explain it, but the feeling inside the like complete confidence and trust in each other, knowing that we're just going to clutch up. I think it made it, it almost guaranteed that we were going to get on the podium. Yeah, it's really interesting. When I was younger and I used to compete against American teams, I mm -hmm. I felt that they were a team of individuals and that mm -hmm. held them back a lot in team competitions. So a lot of the time you'd have like five all-stars, like individually they were incredible, but they were almost trying, they were almost putting their individual goals ahead of the team and that off quite often they then went on to have mistakes they did still did have successes as well in that time but mm -hmm. i often i now when i look at the american team and the team that you're part of you guys look like you're a unit and i think you're much you're much more dangerous if i'm looking at the gb team i, I you know three four five years ago i'd be like i will beat them now i'm like oh i know they're they're quite tough to beat now um <laughs> As a team and a coaching team, like with the national team, um, yeah. I believe it's right that a few years ago, 
they changed the strategy to really focus on the scores. Um, if that is correct, Fred, how do you think that has had a positive impact on now you guys being able to go out under pressure and hit routines all of the time? Not only hit routines, but to start doing quite large difficulty so that you're quite yeah. you're, you're now competitive with Japan and China um, in, in terms of difficulty. Not everywhere, but you are competitive now. Yeah. So what they did a couple of years ago is in our country, in the U.S. Championships, the Winter Cup, they they created this bonus system. Basically, they they were trying to push it. So if you wanted to try something, a hard skill, you know, a G skill or F skill, but you fail at these competitions where this is the only chance to make the U.S. national team, most people wouldn't want to risk it. But they created this bonus system in place where you had incentive to try the skill. If you've messed up, it almost negate the the one point fall difference. Really? Wow. And if you it was there were some big bonuses, and if you hit the routine, you were getting almost a point in bonuses. So, for instance, Asher Hong, the one he well, if you know Asher Hong, he does yep. a Rise Guang on vault, yep. right? Now, the first year they had that bonus in place, his Rise Guang would get 1.6 in bonus. Wow. So he was starting from a 17.6 start value. Now, if he fell, it didn't matter. He still <laughs> he still would score yeah. as high as everybody else. And so they had this incentive, you know, at the biggest U.S. competitions in the country, it doesn't matter if you mess up, they want to see the big difficulty because they know four years later when you start to master it and compete it easily, it's because, you know, you were risking it back then. I remember my casino on high bar, which is G-Skill, right? Yeah. At the I, this, I learned I first caught a casino two weeks before the national championships, which is the only competition I can qualify to the U.S. team. I definitely wouldn't have risked throwing a skill that I only caught two weeks before at that competition. But then, the but with the bonus system in place, I gained I think one point one in start value from doing that skill added on. So I was like, okay, if I fall, my start value is the same. Yeah. If I hit it, I have one point one start value increase. So then I threw it in there. I caught it both days, and I never didn't compete at Casino again. Wow. And have they now reduced that bonus? Yeah. So what they did, they started that bonus the year at the exact year of the last Olympics, the year after. And every year they reduced it more and more. And now this year there's zero bonus. Wow, that's so that's incredibly smart. Like who who mm -hmm. was behind that? Who was the person behind that? Yeah, um, it's definitely just the heads of our US committee. Um Jason Woodnick, um, I think, yeah. But it was, I think it was a very smart idea, especially because they're more looking for the juniors. You know, for us, it was great. We have about three years to push and mm -hmm. feel safe about it. But for the juniors coming up in the U.S., the ones that have six years, seven years, they also, they still have their bonuses in place. They still are incentivized while they're 13, 14 years old to push these big difficulty routines they'll have six years to clean it up and be comfortable with big difficulty. So I know in the future, you know, four years from now, we'll, we'll see an even stronger country. Yeah. But it made a big difference of us having done big skills for a couple of years before like these world championships and this Olympics. And now we can focus on execution. That's amazing. That's a brilliant piece of insight. That is me. And it probably explains a little bit why you've caught up those other nations in difficulty like as a team. Uh, yeah. When we go back to the worlds, Fred, was there any part of your success there that surprised you? Because you won that bronze medal even with a four, right? So were you expecting to be there in the top three? Um, or did that surprise you a little bit? So I was, I knew I could get the top three and I knew I had to just, when I first walked into the competition, I knew I just have to do what I always do. You know, I don't have to be special today. I don't have to do the most perfect routines possible. Just have an average day. And I was just having fun with it. You know, I said, I'm 19. I have plenty of world championships after this. Let me go out here and have fun and just see what I can do. And then after parallel bars, I look up at the scoreboard. That's the worst mistake I could have done. I look up and I see I'm, at, I'm in second place <laughs> at the world championships. You know, I could, I could go to first place. I could fall out and go to fourth place. Or I could stay where I am. But that's when the pressure hit. And that's when, I, you know, I enter hybrid, which is my best event. But with so much pressure mm. and then you know i fell under pressure but such a big learning experience of how i should handle pressure what i would have done different i learned so much from it from there i had thought there's no chance i'd go on podium you know mm. i thought it would be one of those kind of revenge arcs where you know i probably get stuck at fourth place at the world championships no medal go home into this next olympics saying you know just every day giving in my all and knowing 
you know, I'm going to come back even hungrier. Mm-hmm. But then I was like saying all that to myself right after I finished that, the high bar team, which I finished as cleanly as possible. Once I fell, I said, you know what, you know, I'm going to do what I came here to do, have fun and just show what I can do. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really care anymore. I was just going to see if I can execute the rest of the routine as perfect as possible, finish it up as clean as possible. I think definitely the cleanest ending of a routine I've ever done. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, all right, it's done. It's over. But it's part of the path for the future ones. And then I still ended up getting a medal. <laughs> that was the highlight. That was the unexpected part. But I still kind of, I still keep that same mentality of the universe wanted me to be rewarded for everything I gave and get yeah. that medal, but still keep that humble, mm. hungry mentality going into this Olympics. And it was and high risk, high reward, right? You, it wasn't like you did an easy high bar. You've got a very difficult high bar routine. So for me, yes. even if you go into that situation, you take a big risk and you have a fall, I was pleased that you won that medal even with the fall because I was like, he's taken big risk. And quite, oft, quite often, especially in all around finals, uh, people tend to play it safe on high bar, right? I'm a, I'm a high bar worker, so I like it when someone takes a big risk because yeah, it's hard, right? High bar is like the piece where you have to let go and you've got to catch it again. Like, that's tough, yeah, uh, especially under pressure. Um, but yeah, it was amazing to see you do that and get that result, mate. Um, next year with the Olympic Games coming up, Fred, how do you feel now about um, going into that as the third all-around best gymnast in the world? Do you, yeah. do you, do, do you, has it sunk in yet? You know, when you go in the, to the gym, do you feel like the third best gymnast in the world? I don't feel like the third best gymnast in the world. When I go into the gym, I feel like the greatest gymnast of all time, <laughs> <laughs> which is a cocky mentality, but that's kind of how I see it. I see very long-term now, I think that's what makes me excited for this Olympics. You know, I'm seeing like how many years will I be in the sport? Another 10 years. I mean, every single day I train, I train like I'm the best in the world. And I may not prove that in the next couple months. I don't know if I'll prove that on this Olympic cycle, but if it's the next Olympic cycle or the cycle after that, eventually what I'm doing every single day as the best in the world will catch up. And so that's kind of how I approach the gym every single day. I almost feel like I'm almost not even obsessing over this thing coming up in six months. I'm obsessing over every single day being the best in the world every single day. And I think when I do that, it's, I'm just gonna be like, oh, I didn't even realize the Olympics is next week. Obviously, I'll realize it, but like, I was just so focused on every day winning that I'm just gonna go to the Olympics and do the same exact thing, and we'll see where that ends up. Yeah. Do you feel like being 19 and you'll be 20 when the games happens, mate? Do you feel like mm-hmm. going in as a 19 year old and a 20 year old, being quite naive to your first Olympic games, is gonna be a big advantage? And do you think? you'll be able to keep that mentality of, I've got nothing to lose, I'm just playing to win, even though now technically you do have two bronze medals to lose, right? And you, you can't lose them, no one's going to take them off you. But going into that that games, you are the third best team in the world and the third best individual. Do you think you're going to be able to keep that mentality of, right, I'm here to enjoy it, make the most of this experience? Or do you think when you get there, it's going to be very tough to, to not say to yourself, wow, like I've got a real opportunity to win a medal here? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm young or it's just kind of how I think, but I think I'll probably have that same mentality of trying to have fun. I don't know if it's just the way I grew up in the gym of, you know, I train to have fun every day. You know, it's I don't do gymnastics for a chore. You know, I don't come in six days a week forcing myself in the gym because I have to. I just do it for fun. And I think I'm just going to show up on that Olympic day with the same thing in mind. Like I'm doing this sport for no one but myself. And I know that there's there's something better. It sounds crazy, but I've, I'm realizing like there's something I love more than the medal or the end result or the score that shows up, and that's the feeling in the moment. You know, the just the living in the moment. And so I'm I'm gonna enjoy that. I think, and I'm and I know, especially because I know I'm young and I have more opportunities after. I think why not come in with that mindset? And the amazing thing about Paris, right, is that you're gonna have a crowd. You know, yeah. uh, when I watched when I when I watched Tokyo, I just felt so sorry for all those gymnasts competing and athletes yeah. competing. Because when you're a kid, you close your eyes and you dream of competing at the Olympic Games with a crowd, and it just it, everybody that I've spoke to that competed at that games and we've had on the podcast, they said it just wasn't the same. It wasn't the dream that was sold to them when they were a kid. So it's great that you're going to have that experience of competing with a full crowd in Paris. It's going to be incredible, mate. Um, you've yeah. built a presence online, Fred. 
you, you know, I've been watching you from afar and what you're doing. Um, and it seems like it's something that I can't imagine you've not thought about it and there wasn't a plan to what you were doing. Why have you decided to kind of build this online presence, be, a, I guess, a content creator? You're doing very well now. It's very successful. Uh, the, the videos you do where you're getting other college athletes from different sports to try gymnastics, you try theirs. They're doing incredibly well. It's helped build this profile. And on top of the success that you've had, you're now getting some sponsors come on board. Um, just take me through that, uh, whether it was planned and um, whether that, puts any more pressure on your shoulders that you're almost drawing the attention to yourself you know mm -hmm. great question um so uh, this whole journey definitely started when i was about 16 years old i would say three years ago this was during covid you know everybody's home um just secluded from the world you know couldn't go anywhere do anything and i felt like that's when i had so much time to think and feel like who do i want to be when when i'm older kind of what's my effect on the world and it felt felt pretty small Number one, because yes, I did gymnastics and I wanted to be the best in the, the world in gymnastics, but it still felt like how many eyes are really on me? Maybe one time every four years, a lot of the world might be watching. Other than that, you know, no one really cares about your story or is really following to the level of these other sports. And I started then this beautiful thing of social media, TikTok was starting to pick up and I was like, wow. People are just getting millions of people to see them and know their story. Um, and at first, I didn't really connect with gymnastics. I was like, that's pretty cool. And I was bored in my house in COVID. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I try making a TikTok? Because why not? And I made like the stupid skit. It had nothing to do with gymnastics. It got like 300 views. This is off an account with zero followers. I just posted and I said, whoa, you reached 300 new people in the world when no following, like, no, they didn't previously know you. Like, this opportunity is kind of huge. And then when I went back to the gym, I was like, let's see what happens when I actually show off real gymnastics or some fun stuff you can do with gymnastics. And that got a 1,000 views, then 5,000. And to me, that was like, whoa, that's, I can't process what 5,000 people in front of me looks like. Yeah. And so from there, I was like, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. It's fun to do my gymnastics. I now have the creativity and, like, freedom to do whatever I want. Because right now we follow this code book, but with social media, you know, I can do gymnastics in so, other, so many other ways. I can flip over people. I can flip into things. I can do whatever I want just for fun. Let's see how the world reacts to that. When that starts hitting hundreds of thousands of people and then millions of people, I'm like, okay, huh. Now the world really can watch. Mm. This is a whole different opportunity I've never even thought possible for my sport. And that's when I kind of started really loving the content and the freedom of being able to tell my own story and and get people interested in the sport. So that's when I started pushing it. Was there any pushback, Fred, from coaches or the gymnastics community or USA Gymnastics? Because we had an experience in the UK where Niall Wilson was doing the same thing, right? And there was a lot of pushback, like he needs to focus on the sport, like he's gonna, his results are gonna start to go downhill, like this isn't good. But actually, you know, he was able to compete at a very high level and still do the content as well. Has there been any pushback with you and, and what you've been doing? Yeah, um, definitely pushback. Um, so was, I, there's always small pushback. Like I was doing some stupid stuff content wise, not because I was chasing views, but my personality when I was younger, I've always loved to kind of just do crazy things and challenge myself. I used to, you know, with my friends, teammates, we do these crazy stunts. I think we're all gymnasts. We've all done things like that where, you know, you're, I don't know, jumping off high bars or throwing each other off, things like that, you know, just crazy stuff where your coach is like, you're going to break your neck, you're going to get injured, you know? So when I came to the content, I started doing not, obviously not crazy risky stuff, but still stuff where it's like, why are you risking this for content? Really, I was risking it because, again, not chasing the views or the numbers or whatever. I just love that challenge of pushing yourself, having fun. But so there was pushback of like, some of this stuff is dangerous, you know, you're risking your career to do this. Um, but I don't know. Someone told me this, which is pretty funny saying. I don't know if, if it's really true or not, but they basically said, like, how do you get stronger when you're, like, in general? You push against, you push against some type of force um, against you. You push and you push and you tear muscles and you go against it, and that's how you build strength, right? That's how you build muscle. That's the same thing with kind of doing anything impactful in the world. If there's not pushback, you're not really changing anything. You're not growing yeah. from it. And so 
yeah, just push back, whatever. I'm, I'm just going to keep doing my thing. And it means that I must be doing something. So, yeah. So I noticed that on your Instagram uh, page that you've got an agent now. So, mm-hmm. you know, agents must look at you and go, wow, they'll just see money, right? So how do you <laughs> make sure that, you know, I almost, your career arc so far, and it's very early, is quite similar mm-hmm. to, let's say, someone like we mentioned him before, Sam McCulak, even John Orozco, 2011 Worlds, he, I think he qualified in third, one of the, you know, incredibly exciting, potentially like gymnasts like myself, like 17, 18, one of the best gymnasts in the world, maybe didn't go on and, look, Sam and John had incredible careers, they did, yeah. but maybe didn't go on to really reach their full potential. I certainly believe mm-hmm. I didn't, and that's, there's many factors involved with that. How do you make mm-hmm. sure now, you spoke about wanting to go to the next three Olympic Games, how do you make sure you maximize your potential over the next decade? Yeah, um, I guess I'll tie it in with the agent first because you brought up the agent. Yeah. Um, number one, when I talked to my agent before he was my agent, you know, signing with him, we first had to figure out kind of what's my vision for who I want to become, what's his vision of who he sees me becoming, and are our goals very aligned, you know? Is our 10-year plan the same? And so when that became the same, that's when I knew I could trust him and that he was the right fit for me. And that, I mean, we both have the same goal, you know? The goal is not for me to just be a content creator and do these crazy things. It's to be the the best gymnast of all time, Mm -hmm. while also being successful in the media, the sports media world of not just creating content, but then going on to do TV shows, movies, just push the sport. I want to be someone who leaves men's gymnastics in a much better place than it is right now. Three, four times as many people in the sport in the U S than there is right now. And so when we are aligned those goals, I knew that he's the right fit. Number one, and that I'm on the right path. You know, I think you have to believe in your journey. Number one. And it, just, it means so much more to me than just the Olympics, you know. Yeah. The Olympics kind of feels like step number one on this journey. But I, I want to change the sport. And I think it's going to take a lot more than just performing at that high level. So that's why I do all these other things. And that's why I'm obsessing now. Because 10 years from now, I want it to be in a whole different like place. How do you think you do that then, Fred? Like, how do you get men's gymnastics in America first to the level that it's at on the women's side of the sport? And then secondly, mm-hmm. after that, globally... How do you become like, how does a gymnast, because nobody's really done it, right? How does a, a set for Simone Biles, of course. Yeah. How does a male gymnast become somebody that people recognize internationally across the world outside of the very small gymnastic community in which we exist currently? How do you think you do that? What is the secret? Uh, uh, somebody commented on a, a, a clip from the podcast recently and he said, mm-hmm. the difference is with the women's program in the U.S., the women win Olympic medals every sen- single Olympic Games, so they're getting that exposure all of the time. What do you think it is? What's that difference there that's missing at the moment? I mean, they're completely right. I mean, it does. It definitely just comes down to, number one, exposure. Um, reaching millions and millions of people every single day with your sport is going to turn something in their head, in millions of people's heads, that makes them respect your sport a little bit more, understand the sport more, understand who you are, and support you on the journey. Um, winning medals, Olympic medals, obviously gold medals is going to definitely contribute to exposure. That's the goal of, of being at the highest level. But there's many other ways to do it. I mean, when I work with other athletes and I show my respect for a different sport like football by working with a football player and his respect for my sport of gymnastics when he's learning flips and stuff, his audience of football players, kids who do football, people who love the sport of football also see gymnastics on that same level and start to respect it. You know, when I work with all different athletes across different sports and I bring people from their sport into our sport, just off pure respect of seeing us interact with each other's sports, respect each other's sports, it really, you know, changes people's perspective of the sport. And I think it comes down to just being in a lot of different areas. You know, I'm not trying to only be a gymnast and stay stuck in gymnastics and someone who's a football player, like a football player, football fan, Like, why would they have incentive to only watch my gymnastics? When I start showing that the sport of gymnastics is built into every sport, you know, everybody should do gymnastics when they're younger, because even if they don't want to be an Olympic gymnast, they want to be a successful basketball basketball player, football player. There's certain basics, certain techniques that they can learn from gymnastics and take to a different sport afterwards. When I show those things in what I do, 
it makes everybody respect the sport. And that's what I'm trying to build. We had a we had a clip from a podcast that went viral recently, Fred, where I basically argued that if you took the Olympic champion from every single sport and you got them to mm-hmm. compete against each other, the the gymnast would be able to do the fundamental basics in all of the other sports, but the other sports mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to do the fundamentals in gymnastics. And there was a lot of angry people online that were very <laughs> insecure about their own sports. But that's kind of what you're doing, right? You're comparing yeah. sports to each other. And uh, it's amazing what you're doing and giving gymnastics a platform. Uh, and I agree with you, mate, that gymnastics is just one of the base, best base sports, right? You've got to use everything from the top of your head to your toes. Um, mm-hmm. It's just an incredible sport for kids to get into from an early age and then go into other sports, right? Like it's, it's yeah, it's an amazing thing to do. In these next four months now, Fred, how do you as a team, you know, first of all, you've got to make the team, right? Because that's one thing that I've noticed that you've done recently. You you went on that uh, a TV show in the US and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you're being very vocal about the fact that you think I'm going to be in Olympic Games and I want to win an Olympic medal, which straight away, it's brave of you to do that. You're putting pressure on your shoulders already, right? Because you've still got to compete at those trials um, and, and earn the place first. But if you do do that and you're on the team, you go to the Olympic Games, how do you guys hold off the British team? Because right now, it's for the last few years, it's been you and Great Britain going for that bronze medal, right? And then yeah. how do you also try and catch the two teams that are above you? So China and Japan. Do you do that by just focusing on the guys above you? Or have you got your eyes on the British team as well? Yeah, so that's the beautiful thing about our sport of gymnastics. These, the British team, the Chinese team, the J- Japanese team, they have no effect on our gymnastics at all. This isn't, this isn't a physical sport. There's, there's no reason to think about any of these teams, honestly. I think we all know our path to being the best gymnast we can be in four months from now. And it, it's going to come down to us. It's not going to come down to how we affect Britain, how Britain affects us, or how we affect first place or second place. It comes down to how we perform at the highest level we can perform at. Mm. And so it's going to be optimizing thinking about ourselves and these other teams. I mean, these are forces that we can't control. And these are forces that should not control us or affect us. And so I think we as a country know that in our minds. And I think we're going to enter the Olympics thinking, what can we do and where are we and how are we going to perform to the best of our abilities? And these other teams, if they beat us because they perform at their highest ability and they was better than us then they deserve the win but there's nothing we can do to affect each other and we're just gonna do our thing basically tell me a little bit fred uh we're getting close to like the end of the conversation but just tell me a little bit explain what it's like going up and putting your hand up to let's say do a pommel horse routine in a team final when it's not just mm-hmm. your dream in your hands it's the four guys that are sat on the chairs <laughs> watching you mm-hmm. do that routine how how different is that pressure so that's the interesting thing. So I was standing there at World Championships before I go, and a lot of pressure, you know, I'm, hands are sweaty, you're, you're, I don't know, you could just feel the pressure for sure. And you, you want to, like, you see your teammates there and you really want to, you know, represent them strongly. And you know your parents are in the crowd and your old coaches are in the crowd. You know your whole country, like you represent your whole country. And there's two ways you can look at it. You could look like all this pressure is riding on me to represent everybody. Or you can look at it as it as all of these people are here behind me and their energy basically is gonna help push my routine forward. And it's I'm doing this routine. It's like the team is doing this routine, not just me. Mm. And it kind of takes power, less takes pressure off of you and starts and that power kind of feels bigger than you. And so when I go up there and I'm like, I'm not the only one doing this routine. The USA is doing this routine. My family, my old coaches, my teammates behind me are doing this routine. It gets a little easier. Then when you touch the pommels, before you go up, you're like, you still feel like, I don't know, you don't know what to expect, you know? But when you touch those pommels, you realize, oh, this feels the same, like the same texture as the pommels I've touched the last million, like thousands of days. And when you jump up, you realize like, oh, my body feels physically exactly the same as all the other routines I've done. And when you start doing that routine and you realize like, I've done this so many other times, again, it kind of goes back to just all these forces that make it seem different than it is. But when you're really in it and you realize my body weighs the same, when I push down, that it has the same effect as it always has. You know, I can do every skill the way I've always been able to do it. 
You know, you don't need to do it yeah. crazy different. Yeah. It's just the same it always has. That's when you start competing smoothly. It seems yeah. to me, Fred, like you're a very competitive guy and you just enjoy it. You love competing. Are you disappointed yeah. that you're not going to have the opportunity to compete against the Russia, Russian team at the Olympic Games? You know, they're the reigning Olympic champions. And for whatever reasons yeah. that remain outside of your wheelhouse, it's all to do with politics and what's going on in the world right now. Just that purely as a competitor, are you disappointed that you don't get to compete against the Russian team? That's a great uh, question. Um, I thought a couple of years ago. And I, honestly, I still do. I think as much as it's hard to say it because sports and politics, I don't think they should be mixed. I think, you know, when we, at the end of the day, once we enter this, the sports world and we're on the field, I'm not really thinking about how my country feels about their country. I respect them as competitors, not anything that's happening in the background. Mm. So, you know, I used to think and probably still do. I don't like to talk about politics much, but I don't know if, these guys specifically deserve to not be able to compete because of what their country is doing. Yeah. So I think they should be on the floor. Um, and yeah, from a purely like competitive standpoint of just getting to face everybody, yeah. the best in the world, getting to see how I match up, I would love to see them on the floor. But I understand the situation. Yeah. And and there'll be more to come, I think, in yeah. other competitions. And you see. can only compete against who you can compete against, right? It's whoever's there. Like, exactly. it's, not, it's not up to you. Um, Fred, this has been an amazing con conversation. Thank you very much, mate. Um, like I said, this is the first time we've had someone uh, internationally that's competing at the moment. Uh, we're super excited to follow your progress over the next three or four months and see how you get on. Uh, I wish you all the best, mate. Just to finish up, please just give us what are your hopes for the rest of this year? What are your goals and your plans? Yeah, um, number one plan is, I guess I got two number one plans. One is stay healthy. Okay. Healthy is priority. Number two is have as much fun as possible with this whole process. I mean, there's so many things. Number one, the, the gymnastics of just growing and getting better is feels amazing, especially when you're pushing for the highest, biggest event. The attention that you get, the respect from everybody around you, people realizing, you know, he, you know, he's reaching his full potential and and just respecting that, I think it's, it's a great feeling. Um, I'm just looking forward to experiencing it all, the good and the bad, everything, and just coming out a stronger, better, more grown person from it. So, yeah. But it's going to be fun because I want medals. <laughs> <laughs> good man. It's amazing, mate. It's been yeah. a pleasure to learn a bit about yourself. I think you've got an incredibly wise head on your shoulders for somebody of 19. Uh, I think mm -hmm. your gymnastics is some of the gymnastics that excites me the most at the moment. When I watch gymnastics, I don't watch it as much as I, I used to. I used to be like a proper gymnastics nerd and would study everything. Uh, now, mm -hmm. not so often, but I'll be looking out for your gymnastics because it's incredibly exciting. It's incredibly clean. And I think it, uh, your gymnastics does really well internationally so yeah super excited uh, all of the best wish you all the best mate and again thank you and hopefully uh, our paths will cross in the future and we'll be able to do this face to face one day yeah alright thank, thank you, you really mate. appreciate it